during these sessions, you know, here you have the most, uh, you know, acclaimed and famous director, the most acclaimed and famous composer revisiting one of their most acclaimed and celebrated pieces of, you know, like franchise or IP or whatever you wanted to think of it, cinematic iconography. And during the sessions, you know, they're recording a cue and William stops and turns to the Spielberg and says, Stephen, right now I have the theme, the indie theme comes in uh, as he throws the punch so that it's ba ba da bum and the punch hits. But I'm wondering if it would be better if it's ba ba dum bum and we're leaping off of it. And it's like, He's a writer. They just want to do a good job, all the way down to the frame by frame level. But I envy that ability to be able to just listen. Like I'm, I'm trying to do that now, and it almost feels like a different language. Like right now, you know, I've, I've talked about this. I'm, I'm trying to learn French. And I've been doing it as of today for 588 days. Uh, that is my streak. Really? Mm-hmm. 588 days. It's something that I started, you know, during lockdown. And I was like, I need to, I want to be able to converse in a different language. I need to keep my brain wrinkly, you know? And, and I so I- I can't believe it's I, been that I, long, though. It's I, wild. You've been in this for a while. Um, no so I, I, I started, you know, 588 days ago. And I'm conversational, you know, I, I can, there's actually a guy that's here in the hotel that um, is from Paris. And, and so when I, I started to speak a little French to him, he was like, that's it, I'm only gonna speak to you in French. So the ability for me to, you know, just be able to listen to words and go, hey, I understand what you're saying. Mm. Um, and the, that, that to me is like you being able, me just playing, this is what I have playing in my hotel room all the time. I have it playing in my trailer, I have it playing in my hotel room. And it's, it's I have this list and I think that, I'm trying to figure out how, how much material's on here. I think I've said it before, it's something like, yeah, uh, 67 hours and eight minutes. Um, so I have, you know, Of everything, almost, like bits of everything or? or, or... Yeah, it's it's a it's a varied mix. I mean, there's Chopin, there's Satie, there's but it's all you know, broadly Vivaldi, classical, all broadly classical, and it's it's called Hotel Room is the playlist, but it's it's like almost three days worth of uh, of just classical music. And what I try to do is just see if I can go. Okay, what is that? And like right now, that my my favorite one is is uh, Sheep's Made. Um, uh, Sheep's may graze. What's it called? Um, Sheep's may gently graze. I think it is, um, which is a In, anything that uh, is sort of drawing. Yeah, sheep may safely graze. Um, yeah, all the liturgical text titles blur together for me because of the countless <laughs> passions and requiems and masses and things that have been written over the years. I have a hard time remembering. Oh yeah, that's from this. That's from that. It's kind of like the Family Guy bit of. You know, name seventeen songs with, uh, with a girl's name as the title, and it's like, you know, Roxanne, <laughs> Roxanne. Lucy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of how I feel the, about the, name uh, 10 the more. biblical title. Yeah, exactly. But I think what's funny is like I, I have a friend of mine who was like, you know, I have a couple people that were like, you were in a big band, you know, and you packed out arenas and you had, you won Grammys and and you have. Um, you know, hits that, that are, that are seminal of a certain time. And they just did a, like a reunion tour and they were like, all of us had to have teleprompters with lyrics. He's like, I don't remember that song. <laughs> and I remember this one. Oh, that's like, I so that reassuring. Ago. That's so, yeah, that makes dude. me feel so much better. Cause I constantly forget my own shit. Uh, that's no, so there, there was even like watching, um, Traveler's favorite video for the longest time was, uh, a live version of Hey Jude that, the Beatles, it was the first time that the BBC was able to get them to get together and on camera. And the, the host was even like, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles. <laughs> like he was so gobsmacked they did that. <laughs> How is this and real? And sat down and Paul is like, John is having to like count him out. I was like, no, 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 not yet. We, we don't come in yet. It's, I was like, oh shit. And you realize they haven't played that song <laughs> since they fucking recorded it. That's amazing. So I, I, I wonder if like Bach was like, she may say, how was that? How does that one go? You're like, Dude, it's like, 
Wait, did, 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 did I write? Did, did I do that one? <laughs> you know, the, especially in Bach's mine? case, I think that's almost undoubtedly true. I would think in his case because he was such a working musician. You know, he was such a kind of blue collar composer. He yeah. was not the Beethoven tortured artist or Brahms who spends 20 years on his first symphony because he's so intimidated by the specter of Beethoven's shadow over that genre. And, you know, these these people who, who think, you know, they, they agonize for weeks at a time. Is it A or A flat in this bar? Bach was kind of like, I need 30 minutes of music by Sunday. So, you know, light the candle, put on the coffee uh, and and just constantly streamed out music for for, you know, decades and decades on a in a very kind of, you know, a gigs, a gig sort of way. You know, he was he was obviously I'm not disparaging that he was a supreme genius, both as a composer and as an organist. He, he clearly he had this when, when you study counterpoint in like composer school. And you what always start with like the relationships that notes have vertically to each other. So, you know, the thing that's so compelling about Bach is a modern songwriter would very typically say, all right, let's start with, you know, all right, they're like, okay, I got a nice groove. Let's put some soft over that. Or So they're thinking, okay, you know, it's modal. I'm in C minor, but it's F major. So we're in a Dorian C minor. And they think in terms of the harmony, but Bach, that modern notion of harmony didn't really exist as we think of it. And so much of Bach's music wasn't, it wasn't that C, E flat and G form a C minor chord. It was that he would write a piece that had three melodies that for a moment correspond vertically to C, E flat and G. So as they pass by each other, they vertically stack to form that harmony, which now we label as C minor. He more or less thought of it as three melodies that he he had a kind of internal set of rules of what sounded good and what didn't. So this idea of kind of left hand, right hand didn't exist. Everything was melody. Everything was tune. And so it's, hmm. and when you think about these fugues and these canons and these, you know, these pieces where there's you know, four, six, eight, ten, twelve melodies all crawling all over each other. It creates these unbelievable harmonies, and it's because he's not thinking in terms of harmony. He's just thinking in terms of melody. So this is where a lot of composers have to start. You know, the, Bach is some of the most complex music in the history of music in this way, and the fact that it just came out of him, it's like the guy was some kind of savant. The fact that he he got this muscle so engaged in his brain, because there's been a lot of really great contrapuntalists in the history of music from Mozart and Beethoven and, and you know, onward from there. Uh, Bartok, one of my favorites, Brahms, the people who, who understood the relationship of simultaneous melodies. It's all just, counterpoint is just line, the study of line in music as opposed to orchestration or as opposed to the verticality of, of um, harmony or anything like that. Bach uh, was, was one of the, if not the reigning champion on just... Um, uh, you know, does the line hold up? In fact, there's this long running joke that th they said every song you've ever heard can be found somewhere in one of the inner instruments in a Bach. Like he just wrote so melodically that, you know, if you find the viola part in bar 75 of, a you know, the St. Matthew Passion, it turns out that's, you know, mm. hey, Jude kind of thing. Like. <laughs> I don't think anybody's ever really? actually really just because he exposed all of the possible combinations of music. It's an apocryphal, you know, it's one of those it's a, it's not a true claim, but the spirit of it is true. It's that he just he wrote just a, one minute of music would contain 5 minutes worth of melodies because if it's if you imagine it in modern terms, if you were to mute all the stems save one, you'd realize that one stem is its own piece entirely. It's not just the bass line or whatever. It's like the bass line is its own interesting tune. That was what made his wow. music so interesting. And it's part of what I think makes Everything it Everything was a hook. S essentially, yes. And, and, and I think the fact that he could play like this, you know, his organ pieces where each hand is playing so melodically independently and often more than one melody in one hand and then also the feet on the pedals where you just think, as a performer, he was on another level that he could write this stuff that he would then have to play. And it's just, I couldn't do it with a gun to my head. I mean, it is it's it is on a level that is kind of hard to comprehend until you start getting into the nuts and bolts of pulling it apart. Ready for me to hit play? I'm, uh, I'm gonna give you no setup. Let this roll for Please a moment. Do.
Okay, now we're like... Uh... Like a Henry Mancini, Carl Stalling, um... Who am I thinking of with the, with the, uh... Looney Tunes, um, that was... Now it's like super mod 60s. It was extremely 60s, and Mancini is the perfect reference. Mancini. Not, yeah, cool. you, you said it, yeah. But you also said something very interesting, very typical of you, and I just want to point out those strings right there. Right where I stopped it. Just like a little dab of lushness floating over the top. And you were correct uh, when you said it feels like John Williams. Uh, this is John Williams, 1967, one of his first <sighs> gigs. Uh, and very early days for his career. This was the very, very 60s comedy with Walter Matthau, The Guide for the Married Man. And yeah, I know the movie. I've never seen it, but I know the movie. But I mean, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but was it? I, I think I know a fact, and I'm very proud. And whenever I feel like I know something, I'm like a little kid running up that just drew something <laughs> in preschool and I want to show it to my dad. Um, <laughs> I'm ready to put it on the fridge. Hit me. John, there, there were two, um, two people that came from like the lineage of Henry Mancini. Is this correct? One of them was John Williams, and the other one was of Jerry Goldsmith. Is that true? Uh, both Williams and Jerry were at Fox at the same time. Um, okay. But Williams, they had very different careers where Goldsmith was extremely focused on being a composer. Williams- uh, Just a pianist, right? He was- Straddled this, the world like of a being studio. a- He was a session pianist uh, with many noteworthy piano solos like like, uh, of course, he was Henry Mancini's pianist and they had a relationship. Um, you know, the the old uh, Peter Gunn theme, boom, 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 yeah. boom, 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 boom. That's Williams down there on the piano and the, on the bottom end of that. And um, he also played on um, uh, the, 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 the very famous um, opening piano of Elmer Bernstein's score to To Kill a Mockingbird is John Williams. Wow. Um, he played on the West Side Story film, the, the score that was put together by Sid Raymond uh, for the, the, the movie version. He, he played on tons and tons of scores. My favorite is that he played on a few of Jerry Goldsmith's scores because Goldsmith started getting higher profile gigs as a composer a little earlier than Williams did. And so Williams was still doing both. And so while I'll give you a break, Johnny. Come in and play piano for me. Kind of, yeah. There's one score in particular that someday we'll have to play on here where he, he wrote some barn burner solos for Williams, too. So it's like a featured part. It's really awesome. Uh, really early, 1960, one of Goldsmith's very first movies. And so Guide for the Married Man, there was this period where young Johnny was known overwhelmingly as a jazz musician because of his chops as a pianist and because he was sort of seen as... You know, if you can't get Hank, Johnny can probably do the job. Uh, and so I, in my mind, I don't know to the extent that I've mythologized this to be true, but it was like, if Mancini said no, your second choice was Williams. So you get a lot of these early scores of, you know, back when his career was overwhelmingly dominated by comedies, where it kind of sounds like, yeah, here's a guy who knows his way around that sound, the kind of cool 60s jazz meets rock meets orchestra thing that Mancini all but invented. Uh, Williams could like ape it pretty well. He feels like almost the proto Trent Reznor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Unpack that for me. Well, I mean, here's Trent Reznor. Like we, I grew up with Nine Inch Nails and and all the many different iterations of of what Trent Reznor did. But I never, never would have thought, hey, the the, the lead singer and the guy who's the brain behind Nine Inch Nails is going to be the go-to, along with Atticus, be the go-to composer, win an Oscar. Twice. David, twice with David Venture. You're like, get the fuck out of here. It's like saying, hey, Marilyn Manson's gonna be an Oscar-winning well, composer. Especially when you add that his he and Atticus's second Oscar was for a Pixar film. It's like, that that yeah. is the thing that that made me really go when it was when it was announced they were scoring a Pixar film. I just remember thinking, 
well, this is going to be the most un-Pixar film ever or the most un, you know, Ross Reznor sounding score. One of the two has to give. Curiously, and I, I was wrong think... on both counts. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't think it's like, all right, Atticus has got to, like, you know, tame the I, Nine Inch Nails in, in Trent Reznor. He's like, I just want to put industrial, you know, synths all over this. I, even the, the documentary with, um, uh, 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 oh, my God, Foo Fighters, uh, Dave, Dave Grohl. Grohl, he, you see the incredible musician, and he was just simply trying to fit in at the time. And so there's so I, many stories I can of see, that kind of thing. Sure, and I can see in John Williams it has to have been. I'm sure we'll get into this. The I'm not the jazz pianist. I'm not this guy, and just waiting for an opportunity for someone to allow him to prove that. Uh, very possibly. Uh, it's hard to say. He definitely stopped going by Johnny at one point because he, you know, started doing serious. You know, it's dramatic Jonathan. works. That's and, too much, John. <laughs> deal. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna meet you in the middle. Um, and uh, but you know, I think that I think that uh, I don't think that his love of jazz. I, I should say I don't think his skill in jazz is purely because of his musicianship. I I do believe he he had a real love of jazz, which I think is part of what made the return to form with Catch Me If You Can all those decades later, his first real time going back in hard on, on a jazz score in decades. I, I think that that seemed to be a really joyous experience. But the 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 reason I um, wanted to share that score and, and, and then I'm gonna play you one other in particular that I'm, I've surely shared with you before, um, but it's from even earlier, 1961. And I believe this is his first like high profile solo credit as a composer um, yeah. on a on a gig and it and it feels like they said we're doing a detective show this is a main title to a TV show they said we're doing a detective show and we really kind of want that Peter Gunn theme that you played on for Hank but obviously don't do that exactly so he does the thing that is simultaneously so Mancini and so Peter Gunn and yet especially we listen to the brass this is the, again that segue off of when you can hear just a snippet of something and you go, I can hear the person in there, even if all the surface level details are really different than, than Star Wars or E.T. or whatever. So here, this is the theme to a TV show called Checkmate from 1961. Yep. Listen to this horn line. Those bones? The little stabs are bones. French horn on the tune. And then now a trumpet. It's just that fucking guitar just writing that arpeggio. I don't know who's playing, but I bet it's like Tommy Tedesco and the whole Wrecking Crew guys. Listen that riot on that. So that's Checkmate. And... 16, dude, that's so dope. And there's a few that I can like... I'm that way with a few few bands. Like I can tell you, it's a Van Halen song. Without like they, they could drop a new single today. Well, not not now. Um, but, but there yeah, was just such a principle. signature tone that not only Eddie had, but also Alex had as well. It's like his drums sounded so. He he had he had built that sound. Um, uh, Phil Collin with uh, or Steve Clark with Def Leppard, same way. There's just like uh, Steve. I think it was uh, uh, Steve Clark played with the metal pick. And so you could always just, there was just huh. always a certain tone that they had. And that's being like able Vic to- That's like Vic Flick, the, the very famous uh, guitarist who played on a kind of janky amp on the original recording of the James Bond theme. That was one of those where it, it became huh. such a signature sound of doing the down, 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 that it was like to recreate that required that guitar, that amp, that guy, because it was a very specific set of ingredients that just found their way into the studio that day. 
that I'm sure was by total accident. And it's like, that's the amp I have to play through. It's like, that's all we got. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, right. just like, yeah, just like wheel in. Ah, here's old Nessie or whatever. You know, they, they, that's what I love about these stories is the, the, the circumstantial casualness with which these timeless masterpieces are made so often, you know, just, oh, well, yeah, this is just the, this is the axe I brought. The, yeah, and this goes back to what we were talking about Bach. It's like nobody ever sat down to write a hit. And if they did, it never became one. Yeah. It was always, I don't know, we we're talking about Hey Jude, like the the uh, uh, now legendary, probably slightly uh, mythologized etymology of that, where it's, it's you know, uh, uh, John Lennon was, was divorcing his wife at the time, and he said, I don't have the heart to tell Julian what this is and so can you can you please break the news to him to paul mccartney as they're driving to their house paul says so your parents are getting divorced and julian starts to cry he goes hey jules don't don't take it bad take a sax on and make it better and john says you can't he wrote the entire song he's like you just can't use julian's name he goes so hey jude and that's where it came from and it's like that's not not someone going okay i'm gonna sit down and write one of the greatest rock songs of all time bach Never like we were talking about sheep may safely graze. He's probably like like, dude, this is gonna fucking hundreds of years from now, people. There's gonna be some stupid dude in a hotel room. <laughs> Actually, in Bach, in Bach's specific case, reportedly, what was his primary motivation was the glorification of God. He was a deeply religious guy, so his music was not is that even. True? I don't. I've never read anything to suggest that that was an act. I mean, it wasn't just that the church employed him. He routinely put biblical illusion and he would he would even make it so that on the sheet music it looks like a literal cross you know hit to him right every time he wrote in three four was supposedly a reference to the trinity like he he really uh took it to heart and i think that it was never this is going to be a hit in whatever the the you know the 1600s equivalent of a hit would be or even this will really get him in the pews this week it was like i hope that this pleases god uh, it would be my understanding of his motivation. There wasn't like a DJ in the church going, all right, congregation, get around. Right now we got that JSP coming at you with a new single. This is She May Safely Graze. <laughs> I think we need to make a uh, Baz Luhrmann style uh, movie about <laughs> right. Bach that uh, has exactly that. All right, everybody, 17th century coming to you live right now from St. Peter's Casillas good. Whatever Saint C I mean, Saint it, Cedar's Casilica. I don't know what word I just said. Yeah, well, it's about as accurate as a typical Boz Lerman piece, so we're in good place. Got um, a different spin here on that Beethoven. The reason why I have fixated on John Williams is because uh, by the time oh. this is published, but a few days from now, as of when we're recording, February eighth, he celebrates two hundredth birthday. His may as well his ninetieth birthday. Damn. And I found myself thinking, I know like my friends who play in orchestras are like, we're basically just in nonstop John Williams concert mode, celebrating his 90th birthday. And I, it brings me such unimaginable joy, as much as I hold Goldsmith up as the grand champion in the world of film. Uh, Williams, not only is he essentially Goldsmith's equal in, in so many ways and in, in so many different ways, but um, I, I relish the fact that as we are talking right now, you know, weekend of just ahead of his birthday, uh, as he celebrates his 90th, he's presumably across town where he lives down, down, you know, kind of more Beverly Hills area, just writing music or having his morning coffee or whatever. The fact that we share this planet with someone who has shaped people's musical taste, has inspired people's creativity, the number of musicians that have become musicians because of a solo they heard in some score, the number of uh, uh, you know filmmakers that fell in love with Steven Spielberg and, 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 and where Spielberg would be the first to say, oh, well, you know, Johnny's the reason this scene works, that kind of thing. Just the impact he has had on the world. I, 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 long people have said, I don't even think Star Wars would have been successful with any other score. Uh, I also think that blast radius has to continue outside of the people who are maybe even just just surface on a surface level aware of who John Williams is. They 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 may not even be able to think about the, all the generation of people who are just now getting into Star Wars or um, Indiana Jones or or anything that we just have almost Harry taken for granted. Yeah. Iconic Harry Potter. 
they don't know necessarily who does the score and they don't necessarily know the background of John Williams, but all they know is that scene in that movie that they love is that due in part to the music that has allowed it to be that. And that to me is what is the most beautiful aspect of this that it's it, like, like right now we're, 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 we're making this thing and, and I'm, I'm thinking about all of the different elements that have to come into play. And yeah, it's, it's the way that camera is capturing it. It's the way that lighting is hitting it. It's the way that the actors are performing it. And it's all of the incredible set design and, and, and the detail that goes into that and, and to the wardrobe and everything else. But it's also like knowing one of the final touches as that, as that film is played out is that someone is going, now how do I bring a new element that really grounds this in this moment, in this intention? You're absolutely right. And, and I love that our conversation started with Bach, who is one of these figures that is almost not a real person anymore. He may as well be the equivalent of the the figures we see in you know in stained glass or 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 you know yeah. who, who we he's an institution and 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 like a he's like this deity you know he's somebody who who no one thinks about you know I wonder uh, I wonder uh, you know if he uh, how he felt when he had a flu or what you know, like no one thinks of him in human terms they think of him as just this this sort of like figure from which music poured forth unto the ears of mankind. And what I love right. is that John Williams is still very much alive. There are people who on a daily basis will shake his hand or chat with him on the phone. And and yet, because he's now 90, he, he especially as the two of us who have this love and appreciation for the history and the artistry of cinema, he rolled with the greats. He, he was under the the tutelage and and supervision of not just Henry Mancini, but like he was hired by Alfred Newman, you know, who was one of the mm. creators of Hollywood music. You know, the, the first generation of composers to come over from Europe and say, what is this new art form I'm curious about? There was this group, Alfred Newman, Dimitri Tiomkin, you know, um, uh, Max Steiner, Franz Waxman, uh, th that, that were part of the initial development of the art itself. And they were still around into the 50s, 60s, 70s when the Williams and Goldsmiths arrived on the scene and along with the Lalo Schifrins and, the, and, and, and you know, Bernard Herrmann's kind of like this middle ground where he started, but he, he went, you know, well into the 70s. And, um, and, uh, but, the, but the idea that he was alongside these legends, you know, that, that, that he uh, came up in an era where he personally interacted with the people that created this art and he's still with us now. To me, he is, I just the other day referred to him as the sort of white rhinoceros of, of music where he's the last of his kind and he's just sort of, uh, you know, when whenever the, the sad day comes that he goes, it will be the closing of a chapter of, of, of the art form itself. And so- Of an era, well, right? Like yeah, it's, it's, like, it's an epoch. And I, I think that building on, on that point, it's, I, there were no Grammys, Oscars. There wasn't like if if you know Bach was as pious as you say, and he was just literally doing it. That that was his form of worship, which by no means is a disparagement. I, I believe that someone who is doing something in service to, um, using their art, using their skill to be able to give back is is is. People can argue with this, but for that person, it is just as important as giving to charity. It's just as important as giving back to the world or whatever. They're doing something in service other than themselves. They're not, they're 100%. doing it to remain humble, right? So the, you know, existential pur purpose of it uh, notwithstanding, that speaks a lot about his character. But I don't know if he was as, there's no way he could be as aware of his greatness, as of his impact, because it's just on a Sunday by Sunday basis, essentially, right? It's like, well, you know, and no one in the church is going to applaud and stand up and cheer and whoop and holler over, you know, holy shit, that was badass, dude. And he's like, thank you very much. Bach, why don't you take a bow? You know, take off your wig for a second. And, oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> yes, I think that know, is no likely to not that. have happened. <laughs> right. Everyone's going to remain very pious, very, very somber in, in celebration of that because that was, especially at that time, considered such a deeply worshipful moment. For sure. Cut to John Williams, who for most people today, it's like, yeah, there's, I mean, I don't know, composers, Bach, Mozart, 
Beethoven, Williams, you know, most people are going to put them all centuries divide them, but their accomplishments unify them and flatten that line to a very linear level. But do you think that John Williams, as you, you know, kind of painted this picture for us sitting in his home that he's always had, right? It's a very modest home. Yeah. He doesn't live in some big mansion behind the gate or anything like he has actually an incredibly normal house in a normal neighborhood. It's a gym. I mean, it's his own lawn or whatever. It's yeah, it's in a nice. If you're in Beverly Hills, it's still it's, a nice neighborhood. But it's, it, yeah, you're not, well, it's he not actually Beverly it, you know. Hills. But I felt, I felt, I felt. Uh, I, I didn't actually want to say exactly where his neighborhood is because uh, I just, I, I, I would never want to put out. I wouldn't want sure, to even flirt with the line of doxing him. <laughs> right, it's in an unassuming area, but Correct. it's it's also something that he's been in. You know, as his accomplishments have grown, he hasn't necessarily upped his. You know, he's stayed within his means, but. Inside that house, somewhere, I assume, are the how many? Thirteen, twelve. I, I have, I, yeah, I have the stats prepared for you. Uh, uh, Fifty-two Oscar nominations, the most of any living person, and the second most of anyone ever, with only fifty-seven going to Walt Disney uh, as the only who has more. And I kind of think that doesn't count, considering that in the old days of the studio system the studio got the nomination and whoever was in charge, it was it was their name on it, which is the reason why Alfred Newman, head of music for Fox, had 45 Oscar nominations because it was in his department that the score was written. So it was like got Alfred it. Newman and the composer, such and such, get a nomination. Where he oversaw it, he helped direct it. He was It wasn't that he was hands off, but he didn't write every note. Williams right. has written every one of those scores personally and songs and, and a few others. So of the four, 52 nominations, he's won five, um, f- which is f- four, uh, f- you know, in reverse order, Schindler's List, 93, uh, E.T., 82, 83, 82. 81. Well, right. Oh, sure. That's always weird with the which year the Oscar is versus the release of the movie. But it's, I think, yeah, 81 was E.T. Um, and then, of course, uh, 77 Star Wars, 75 Jaws. But do you remember what his other Oscar win is? It's always Sorry, one of my favorite. 82. Okay, good. One um, of my favorite trivia about he he won his first Oscar win was in 71 before Jaws, before Star Wars, and it was not for best original score. Well, it, it, wait, yeah, as stated, yeah. Wait, so it was it, wasn't it a sci-fi, but the, it didn't count. No. No, this is one of my favorite bits of uh, Oscar trivia history where uh, in the 60s, for, for a few, for many years, I think this may have even started as early as the 50s, but I can't, I can't remember when it began, but there used to be three categories for music. There was best score and best song like we have today, but there was also a category called best adaptation score, or another way to think of it is best unoriginal score. So original <laughs> score would mean, and, and that's not- Most that's, derivative. Well, that, that's the thing. It, yes, because the reason why is in the same way that today every movie is a superhero movie, back then every movie was an adaptation of a Broadway musical. So they would recreate like West Side Story, South Pacific, Sound of Music, went on and on okay. and on and on. All these musicals were being made into movies. And so composers would have to take the hooks and melodies from those songs and fashion a score to bridge the scenes like a traditional film score, but they're not really writing new material. So they decided to make an entire Oscar category for that. Basically unoriginal music. You didn't write this for the movie. You took it and fashioned it from pre-existing sources. And yeah, so his, this, this is the same as like a script, right? You've got, you know, best best adapted screenplay. It's like absolutely and, the equivalent of that. It, it, it is original sure. screenplay and adapted screenplay. They're both art forms unto themselves. And sure. nowadays there are just not enough films with scores that would fit under that banner to make it worth having its own category. Cause that, that just, there were so many musicals being made that they said, well, we should be honoring the artistry of these composers who are taking those source musicals and taking the songs and figuring out ways to make score out of those melodies and such. And at, and, and in that vein, John Williams wrote the score while having nothing to do with the original songs for 1971's Fiddler on the Roof. And he won an Oscar for it. And that was his first time. What? Yep. Topol. And um, my favorite, as a tangent off of that, my favorite Oscar trivia of all time, which I, I surely have said, if, if not here on Playwatch Listen, 1973, Marvin Hamlish won three Oscars in one night. One of only, I think, twice or three times that's ever happened. 
and it's the it's only time it's everybody. ever happened with a composer um, where he uh, he won for best score and best song both for the way we were um, mm. and but he also won a, for best adaptation and it's one of the only wins that I maybe the only win for that category that wasn't for a musical using material from the musical it was for the sting for which he used Scott Joplin's The Entertainer as his main oh, theme. Yeah. And he actually got to win an Oscar for it because it qualified under the parameters of that category, which I think is hilarious. But all that aside, the, but, go going ahead. back to the, the, the fact of like, do you think with all of those accomplishments and since 1971 having those accreditations and accommodations given to you, do you think there is a level of awareness? And, and if there is, how what makes him superhuman to me is the ability for him to be able to perform and create beneath the burden of that you know a few years ago afi honored him they do once a year a lifetime achievement big awards ceremony they do a televised tv special a bunch of celebrities come and they'll honor you know, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, Quentin Tarantino, whatever. They they always honor someone who has made a massive stamp uh, in the same way that AFI used to do their, you know, top 20 horror films of all time, TV specials and stuff. If you remember those back sure. in the day, yeah, yeah. They, they always do this lifetime achievement honoree event. And a few years ago, maybe 10 years, nine years ago, something like that, um, they honored John Williams, the first and only composer ever honored. And it was a big event. Uh, uh, you know Spielberg Lucas everybody I remember Harrison Ford comes up on stage and they played the um, the uh, Raiders March as he walked up on stage and he was like that damn theme follows me everywhere I go and uh, and uh, it, it was a, it was an amazing event and it, and and the but Williams gave what I thought was a really beautiful speech at the very end of it kind of just two hours of everyone telling him how amazing he is and and every, you know, all the stars of these movies, you know, the Mark Hamill's and Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford. And and of course, having all these legendary directors, not least of which Steven Spielberg, who gave a big speech and and George Lucas and and um, and Williams got up there at the end and he said, you know, something along the lines of um, I just try to do um, my job and I, I I've, I'm so kind of overwhelmed and grateful uh, by this evening. I, I can't really recall anything like this of any, even close to this in my whole life. And the way he ends the speech is he holds up his little trophy and he says, tomorrow morning I'm going to go back to work and sit at my desk and try to write something that's worthy of this. And See, that's a level of like, that's not aw shucks, you know. That, that is someone who has become, I have to imagine, has become a disciplined practice of trying to extricate themselves from the ego to such a level that almost they can't even take credit for what for what it is that he's done. But I, 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 I he may, for all I know, he may have a raging ego, and he's really good at not projecting it but what i do think I don't know, is man. Un, well here's the thing what i think is unambiguous or un un inarguable is Deniable. what undeniable yeah what yeah you, absolutely what is what is undeniable and in, inarguable is that even if he were the world's largest ego the moment he puts pen to paper it seems to disappear because That's from every thing. every musician i've talked to who's who's played under him or has done recording sessions with him, you know, all this LA studio musicians. And I, and I have all these stories I want to get to with my playlist queued up here of along those lines where it, it's always about the work. I remember a story where the orchestra contractor, Peter Rotter was telling me that he was covering the sessions for uh, kingdom of the crystal skull. And he was like, you know, this was the first return to that franchise in a long time. You know, everyone was really excited. Of course, no one had seen the movie, but they were all very excited. And here's John Williams, Steven Spielberg in the booth. And Spielberg always follows him around like a child. He's like got awe and wonder. He looks at him like a like a like the coolest uncle, you know, and uh, and and he always films like on a camcorder or now on his phone. He always films somewhere. Spielberg has a has an archive of like 
every scoring session, every moment of every scoring session of everything he's ever done with, with John Williams, that's not public anywhere because he's always filming him. And uh, so during these sessions, you know, here you have the most uh, you know, acclaimed and famous director, the most acclaimed and famous composer revisiting one of their most acclaimed and celebrated pieces of, you know, like franchise or IP or whatever you wanted to think of it, cinematic iconography. And during the sessions, you know, they're recording a cue and William stops and turns to the Spielberg and says, Stephen, right now I have the theme, the indie theme comes in uh, as he throws the punch so that it's ba ba da bum and the punch hits. But I'm wondering if it would be better if it's ba ba dum bum and we're leaping off of it. And it's like, He's a writer. They just want to do a good job all the way down to the frame by frame level. And, you know, orchestra pause a moment. Stephen, what do you think? Oh, John, I think you did blah, blah, blah. And they, they work it out. And he was telling the story. He said, what I found so amazing was that it was not, you know, coming in with this, like, like the, like the way Apollo Creed enters the ring, you know, with this fanfare and his American flag shorts and, you know, all, everything's just like, celebrate me it's so the opposite you know he walks in through the musician oh. entrance and 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 uh, taps the podium okay i'd like to start with uh, two and five uh, thank you very much and uh, what i was going to say was to, yeah. to me the, the the thing that is self-evident that the ego is not at play is the fact that at some point you're gonna run out of ideas at some point it's going to be derivative of something that you've done at some point, you're going to repeat. Someone's going to go, "Isn't that the thing from this?" And that's what I don't see. So th th the fact that he goes, "I'm just going to go to work again tomorrow," that's going back. We keep making this tie to Bach. It's like I don't know, man. I just got to crank this stuff out because this is in service to something greater than myself. Keep going down some of these because we our, our time is a little bit limited, but I, I have a feeling this is going to be another two-parter. Yeah, it's going to have to be because I um I so I I, I shout out to, uh, uh yeah shout, shout out, out to, to a Ock. friend of mine uh Eric Woods who has a radio show called Cinematic Sound Radio, um is doing a six-part John Williams just massive deep dive where it's almost a it's an almost academic step through the different chapters of his career and offering okay. up trivia and so. I, I wanted to shout out to him because uh, he is um, uh, doing a phenomenal job. And for anybody listening to this down the road who wants something that's more academic in nature about Williams and just wants to know, like, what's the, you know, if I could just listen to six hours of a comprehensive look at his career, that is not what I want to offer. Though I did grab a few of his trivia that I didn't quite have at the tip of my tongue that I, I just wanted to credit him with. I knew the Oscar one because I've always thought that was interesting, but Williams has also six Emmy nominations of which he won three, 25 Golden Globe nominations of which he's won four. He's won seven BAFTAs. This is the real kicker. 71 Grammy nominations, winning 25. And... For score? For everything. There's a bunch of categories. <laughs> I mean, the Grammys have song category. It has a soundtrack category. It also has um, like best instrumental composition of the year, you know, and the, the, there's a lot of best arrangement, you know, those kinds of things. He just gets nominated everywhere he, he could be. Um, nine of the, you know how when you look at box office um, all time records and yes. the, the key is, is it adjusted do. for inflation? Because if right. you don't, you know, the Avengers is like, or, you know, Endgame or, or whatever, Avatar, these are all, you know, massively Gavillions. earning. But when you compare it, when you adjust for inflation, you realize that like Gone with the Wind still holds a candle to these movies that it, it, it's like in uh, today's terms, it's like $2 billion, those kinds of those kinds of things. So when you adjust for inflation, which gives you an actual sense of how much these movies have made, nine of the top 25 of all time have been scored by John Williams. Um, and as if that weren't enough, what I also love is that he has written the music for four different Olympic games, and those themes are still synonymous with the Olympics themselves. You know, the bum bum bum, ba na 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 na, and then the da na 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 na, da 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 da. What's called Olympic fanfare, isn't it? Yeah, they're called like the Olympic spirit, the Olympic fanfare, call of the champions, and I can't remember what the, the fourth one is called. But yeah, man, that's like what yeah, like those. 
Yeah, that those. So just it's hard to have a more storied career. And so the question was, OK, I can't not pay tribute to this person who has been such a force. But I, I thought, what is the what would make it worth us talking about him? And I love that it started with this idea of the humble origins where you can still clock the the artist that we know later. But expanding from that, the things I chose to share are those highlights from throughout his career that I have a very personal connection with. Uh, and they're, they're not necessarily even my favorite works of his, but they are things that um, shaped me in some way. So I want to start okay. with, um, this is in 1970, he did, 1970 or 71, he did a TV movie, which was one of his Emmy wins. He did a TV movie adaptation of Jane Eyre that had George C. Scott in it. Okay. Um, and among Williams fans, this is a well-known score because it's one of those where you hear it and you go, wow, that is so John Williams. And yet this is five years before the Star, Star Wars, Wars, Jaws, all those things that we come to know him for. This is still where him doing dramas was kind of rare and he was still mostly doing, you know, comedies and and quirky you know john goldfarb please come home and about a football team stuck in the middle east and they get all these very 60s movies but then this one he got a chance to really show us stuff but i remember when i heard i i, I in high school where so much of this started with me this is one of those where a few composers john williams and jerry goldsmith being two of the of the most obvious examples if i saw their name on a thing i bought it i didn't know what it was i had never heard of it i'd never seen the movie or whatever and i just bought indiscriminately i all the money i was earning was all like into cds into cds into cds and i was by the time i graduated high school i had a pretty huge collection because it was just all i, I had no other hobbies this was what i was this was this was my obsession and so um I remember Jane Eyre was one that I picked up and it and it captivated me. And there's one, it's this lush orchestral score, but then there's this one cue in the middle that I remember hearing and going, I played it for a friend of mine in the high school orchestra. And she go, and I said, listen to this beautiful piece. It's recorder, guitar, and violin. And she goes, that's viola, not violin. And I remember it was just one of these little light bulb moments. And of course now I hear it and I'm like, oh, that's very clearly viola. But at the time I was still learning all of this probably 15 or something. And I remember it, it blew my mind to think he wrote this little incidental cue for a TV movie and chose recorder, viola, and guitar. And when you listen to it, you also think this guy knows how to write for those instruments. It's, uh, it's just such a magical little piece of music. Here it is. So far, it's still just the two. No viola yet. It has this wonderful, like, minstrel, <laughs> you know. The two, yeah, I mean, the guitar and recorder is really driving that pretty hard. Especially classical guitar has a tendency to skew Spanish, and this doesn't do that at all. And this is not the kind of thing where he just put a lead sheet and told the guitarist to make it sound good like he always writes everything so you have to know what you're doing to write a part like this and then the viola Calling out to each other, you know what I mean? It, it, They're for talking lack of a, to each other. Totally. And for lack of a better way to put it, this is a real piece of music. And one of the things that I've always loved about his writing, that this is such a demonstration of, is that it always feels like he's very much imagining the performer. And because he, he writes yeah. such musical music, he gives them something interesting to do. 
They're never, they never vamp, they never just autopilot, ever. Which makes this music also very difficult, by the way. Even just like the recording of it, like I love hearing, and I feel like you don't, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, I'd have to go back and listen to some different pieces, but especially with like Reed or Woodwinds, there's so much, it, it, it could be almost detrimental to hear the performer in that as opposed to just the instrument. Yeah, the breaths and the key clicks and all that stuff. And this to me, I, I, I hear the, the fingers on the strings, I hear For the armature sure. changing and the lips on that recorder. Yeah, so this piece, uh, it's very 70s. It's like very. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also the really hard extreme panning, like the recorder is only yeah. in the left. You know, it's, it's. That puts it in a room. You know what I mean? That 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 puts them in a relationship to each other. Like viola is here, guitar is here, and the recorder is here. That's a beautiful piece of music, isn't it? My and God, that was one of those that I heard, and it made me as, as as much as Williams is the king of the grand orchestra. I and 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 I rarely think of his music as being derivative from that, unless it's you know purpose built like the jazzy elements of Catch Me If You Can or things like that. But broadly speaking, his default position is the standard, you know, capital R romantic era orchestra wins by three, the whole thing. And the, but that's this rare instance where he wrote something much more intimate and with a kind of odd and interesting combination of colors. And it made me fall in love with the sound of a soloist, which has absolutely shaped me as a composer. Soloists, even when I write big giant stuff, soloists always are a part of it because I just, I love that intimacy and everything that you that you fixated on of like, where you feel the fingers lifting off the string and repositioning on the guitar and, and you have such a tactile connection to the way it's recorded. I just live for that and I've never shaken that. And as much as, as Goldsmith is such a philosophical uh, shaper of my taste and my ideas about what music can be and especially scoring to picture and all of that, um, Williams' real love of the musician. I remember, you know, he's written a lot of classical, you know, modern concert works as well. And but he's never written a symphony. He's never written an opera. It's almost all concertos. It's violin concerto, flute concerto, tuba concerto, harp concerto, cello concerto, like he's bassoon concerto. He's written all concertos, and and it's obvious that the reason why is because he falls in love with a, an instrument and a per, and a performer, and it's like I want to build a platform for you to to play. It's never about the orchestra unto itself it's the orchestra in service of a soloist and that's one of those things that i think is easily overlooked when you think about the star wars and the indiana jones which are largely about the impact of the orchestra but he's writing as if it's 90 soloists in my mind well it's also like that's i think one of the reasons i mean i'm you know guessing but one of the reasons why he and spielberg work so well together is because spielberg does this huge establishing shot right he puts you in Peru. He puts you in, you know, wherever, v massive spaces, um, Valley of the Crescent Moon or, you know, um, yeah, which is Petra. of course Petra or whatever. But the- An island off the coast things. of Costa Rica. Right, and he moves you inside of it mm -hmm. so that in your mind, there's always this big space and you are being allowed entrance, not into just the inner courts, but the the holy of holies, as it were, like, and you're moving into this super small, special place. And what you're talking about to me is the same thing that a soloist does for a 90 piece orchestra. It, I was just reading about this today. It was, it was just talking about the contrast. There's always a relationship of contrast, heat and cold, light and dark, whatever. And the only mm -hmm. reason why we feel comfortable is because we understand that it is the opposite of discomfort. Right. And so by reducing it down to one person, not only do you show how intimate that relationship is in comparison to 90 people, but now that 90 people feel so much bigger compared to the one. And so it's just a genius thing to think of, not do the, 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 the Mutt Lang thing of just, you know, or Phil Spector of just stacking guitars and producing this wall sound, but it's more about, I remember the first time I ever like worked with a, a, a different, um, engineer that I ever worked with before and I was like to make these guitars bigger is like or let's stack it he goes no reduce yeah taking Absolutely. away letting make, air breathe makes it bigger yep I, I, I remember uh, David Spear 
uh, who was a composer who taught a, a workshop I took in New York when I was 18 years old that ASCAP hosted the like screen scoring workshop or whatever uh, uh, is called. And um, David Spear, I remember, made a comment just off the cuff in the middle of that that to this day I haven't forgotten where he said, there's nothing more intense than a pianissimo. And yeah, uh, lean it, in, don't lean, don't lean away. Exactly. Let me play one off the back of that last one, jumping forward to one of my absolute favorite scores of this last 20 years or so of his of his career. Uh, the third, the Alfonso Cuaron Harry Potter film, Prisoner of Azkaban, uh, where he wrote, I think, some of the best music he's ever written in his career, full stop. It, it, for whatever reason, that, because hmm. Harry Potter, you know, everybody knows the theme and, you know, dun, 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 it's all very, like, the fact that after so many iconic things, they go, by the way, we're making this very, very popular set of children's, uh, your young adult uh, magic sorcery school novels, you know, Chances are this really needs to be a, yeah, this needs to be another, can you give us another Star Wars, Indiana Jones, E.T., Schindler's List level score? And he does, and uh, just just knocks it out. And he did the first three films only. Um, and the score for the third one for me is one of the all-time greats. And there's a bit in there that I love because it, again, his, it's the musicality of this is so unbelievable where it, it, he's he's channeling Renaissance music but he's doing it in a way that is more modern, and yet it is sort of academically accurate to the traditions of the Renaissance, especially when you hear these weird rhythms of this like, uh, da, uh, da. They, they refer to that as a hocket. And um, he, he just nails it, and it's just so, I just thought, God, this must have been fun to perform. Man, those strings are working. Oh man, it's so tight too. I'm fairly certain this is I the think LSO. About you, I think about you uh, constantly when you say he's always um, writing forward. Like it, it's everything is just constantly like you feel like you're just, the, the planks of the bridge are literally being laid underneath their feet as they're hitting him and just touching off. Yeah, like Iceman. Yeah. And then listen, boiling it down to the solos. Now this this violin solo is what I love. It becomes like a fiddle more than a violin, you know what I mean? Brings back the orchestra. When I was referring to the Hockett and the kind of, uh, you know, that, that Renaissance um, legitimate sound, that's this here. Recorder again, yeah? Yeah, and he also has these shams, which are the precursor to the oboe. Very buzzy and abrasive sound right here. Yeah. And here's the, that rhythm is such a very accurate kind of pull for him to do. Is that like a, not bassoon, but like an oboe? Is that kind of in the same? The shawm, yeah, the shawm is very much the oboe's precursor. And there's an instrument also called the sackbut, which is kind of like the precursor to the bassoon that's in there, um, doing all the boom. And then, yeah, another, this beautiful theme, window to the past. Uh, that's a, a recorder feature and everyone who plays recorder now has to learn. So this score to me is just one of those absolute magical, you know, he just was on. He, he absolutely um, was having the time of his life by the sound of it, even at that stage in his life, even the third Harry Potter uh, and yet just pure magic. Um, I we're gonna have to pause here, but I feel like we right. jumped over a lot. Oh yeah, no, I'm go not going in any kind of chronological <laughs> order here because I, I w there's a whole lot of stuff that we've got to do here. Um, yeah, I have but, I have a probably a half dozen more pieces that I just 
have to share. They're really reasonably deep cuts for Williams, but also they're ones that I have a story attached to each one uh, that is just personally meaningful as to why I am even here today. So yeah, let's keep it going. <laughs> 